I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us here in closing arguments. And every time you say those three words, stand your ground, stand your ground laws, we think of the state of Florida. Uh, Florida is one of several states that have stand your ground law. And I say this every time I cover a story involving stand your ground. I mean, it, I mean, it's an appropriate law to have. The reason being that the purpose behind it is that people have a right to protect themselves. And when you're protecting yourselves, there should be some means within our judicial system to immunize you, to keep you from being prosecuted or sued civilly, right? Someone breaks into your house, someone goes to mug you, right? And you defend yourself and they die or they get hurt, right? You're standing your ground. They shouldn't be able to sue you. You shouldn't be prosecuted for that. And that's the purpose behind Stand Your Ground Law. Now, what happens is when you have cases and trials and defendants are looking for defenses, uh, many times they claim Stand Your Ground. Doesn't mean that it's true, but they claim it. And you have to have a hearing before the trial. So in a case where it's a Stand Your Ground case and it's a homicide, you have two people involved in what happened but if they're the only ones there at the time that it happened, then you only have one story at trial. And that's from the survivor, the one who has been charged with the homicide, but is claiming stand your ground. So they have their version of what happened and why they did it. What you don't have is the victim's version of what happened. So it, it's, it's tough. It's tough for prosecutors when someone's claiming self-defense, stand your ground, there's only two people there. And, and it comes down to credibility because credibility is everything. It's everything. And for the person who survives, they've got to be deemed credible by the judge in a stand your ground hearing, by the jury in a trial. Because they're going to tell their story. If it's just two people there, there's no video, there's no third witness who's telling the jury or the judge what happened, then the defendant has to be the person to do it. And their credibility is crucial. So for Ashley Benefield, um, the question's gonna be, does her story, does it make any sense? Does it make any sense what she said in light of the story of these two people, of their lives, what was happening, what happened at that moment, what the forensic evidence says? All of that is relevant as you try to figure out if she was standing her ground and defending herself or she was committing homicide and killing someone in an unjustifiable way. That's what this is all about. Let's go down to Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who was inside the courtroom today, joining us live from outside the courthouse down in Manatee County, uh, Florida. Um, Ashley Benefield on trial for the murder of her husband, Doug. Uh, what did we learn today specifically about the shooting itself, Chanley? Great to be with you, Vinny. Today was all about the prosecution's case, and it has the burden today to disprove or overcome her claims of immunity under Stand Your Ground. So the prosecution today called eight witnesses, a couple of those crime scene technicians and a detective that responded to the scene that home September 27th, 2020, 2020, excuse me, when Ashley shot her estranged husband, Doug Benefield, and she wouldn't speak to them. She gave no statement. In fact, she still Bill hasn't given any sort of statement, only this uh, motion that her attorney wrote and filed on her behalf. But the neighbors observed her running across the street with a gun in hand, yelling for help. So they had to piece together what they observed at the scene. They took photos of the bedroom where he was shot. They tried to piece together the bullet uh, trajectories based on bullet holes in the wall. They took photos of Ashley and any potential scratches or bruises she may have had on her at the time. And, but investigators soon learned and based on Doug's injuries that he was shot from a distance and from an angle that didn't seem as though he would have been on the attack. In fact, prosecutors called the medical examiner who conducted the autopsy on Doug Minifield to talk about uh, the fatal wound and the path the bullets took. Let's watch. This wound uh, traversed the leg in an upward angle from the back toward the front and also from the left toward the right.
I wanted to ask you a question about the chest wound. Um, what organs did it hit or what important things did it hit? <laughs> so the, the projectile path went uh, through the chest wall on the right side and then it hit the right lung. It went through the vertebral body uh, or vertebral column uh, of the spine. Did not appear to hit the spinal cord in that track. After passing through the spine, it then hit the left lung and then went through the chest wall on the left side to end in the tissues where we found it. So the medical examiner saying the path was right to left. He did on cross-examination, though, uh, admit to the defense that Doug could have been facing towards Ashley at the time of the fatal wound to the chest, even though it traveled right to left. But this was graphic, difficult testimony, as you know, seeing those autopsy photos and the family of Doug Benefield in the courtroom. Vinny uh, became emotional. His daughter, Eva, from a previous marriage, actually had to leave the courtroom to compose herself. Yeah, we've had Eva on the show. This has been such a, a tough, difficult time for her. Um, her mom dies tragically, then dad gets remarried, and then he ends up getting shot and killed, so she's left without a mom or a dad at this point. Um, so now the defense is, is on the attack. I mean, they're attacking uh, Doug Benefield because from their perspective, they're saying she's standing her ground, he's the aggressor, he's the bad guy, she's the victim, right? Um, they talked about his alleged history of violence. They did on the cross examination of state witnesses today. Her defense attorney would repeatedly bring up these prior allegations that she still maintains against Doug Benefield that happened not only to her, but also their shared child together. So in this motion, I keep referring to because again, tomorrow we will hear the defense call witnesses many, but in the motion uh, that led to this hearing, here's the specific allegations that she does still make against uh, Doug Benefield. She describes at one time he fired a handgun into the ceiling of their kitchen in an effort to intimidate her during a fight. He threw a loaded gun at her at another time. He also punched their dog in the face hard enough to render the dog unconscious. She also says he regularly, Doug, carried a loaded concealed firearm. She did too. He also... Um, unlawfully placed a tracker on her car, she says, and that she observed him tailing her. He actually was caught, there is a police report, uh, by a neighbor catching him peering into her window. He also punched holes in the wall of their home during a fight, and she alleges that the previous marriage had a history of domestic violence. As you can imagine, Doug's family says this is all exaggerated and untrue. If he did anything, which he did admit to in some of the depositions attached to the defense motion. It was in frustration, not at her, not to intimidate her at all. In fact, today on the stand, the very first witness was the cousin of Doug Benefield, Tommy, who addressed the incidents, uh, saying that they were false and specifically talked about the incident with the dog. Let's watch. Big dog, big nails, jumped up in his lap, and he was frustrated, and it hurt. Aggressively pushed is one way, is what he told me. Okay. He admitted that was more than he wanted to do to the dog, but it was due to his frustration at the time. He pushed the dog off of his lap because it was cutting into his legs. So at no time did he say he punched a dog? No, ma'am. At no time did he say that the dog went unconscious? No, ma'am. So, Tommy, a way to get in Doug's, who can't be here, obviously, his words, his version of the story and, and through his testimony. But the defense is hoping Vinny, that the judge sees these prior alleged incidents of violence as a consideration into what was going on in Ashley Benefield's mind at the time she pulled the trigger. And again, this is coming up through cross-examination. But if you want to convince a judge or a jury about what Doug Benefield was doing and what he did that night, I mean, she's the one that's got to get up on the stand and say that. And, it and then it'll come back yep. to her credibility. Like, you're, they're attacking him. Um, I mean, it's part of their case. He's not here to defend himself. He's got his cousin and maybe someone else. But it's, it's again, it's a challenge for prosecutors. It's really a challenge for prosecutors in these types of cases. So um, these two had a bitter, bitter,
better battle in, in family court, and that came up today, didn't it? It did, and prosecutors say that is a necessary background and context for this judge to consider the first couple of witnesses, the cousin, even the former family attorney for Doug Minifield taking the stand, providing that tumultuous background, a bitter child custody dispute, so much so that the judge allowed the prosecutors to play a, a recording of the family law judge who had to decide whether or not Ashley's claims uh, she wanted sole custody of their daughter were true or not and if she would actually grant that request and so here's a piece of what this judge heard in court this court will find that as far as credibility is concerned i would find and i'm going to say this in the gentlest form i possibly can that there is absolutely not a single scintilla of credibility that i'm attaching to anything that was testified to at least in this hearing of miss benefield this judge in family law court, Vinny, didn't mince words. That was a powerful moment for prosecutors to be able to play that in the courtroom, to basically have another judge say all of those allegations were unfounded. She dismissed those claims, did not believe Ashley Benefield, who testified in those family uh, law hearings. But uh, also, in addition, the attorney for Doug, she was on the stand. This was during her testimony earlier today. She really provided a vital timeline of how this relationship eventually did crumble and lead to Doug's death. Let's watch. What was to happen at that hearing? There had been a lot of discussion leading up to that, and the plan was that the September 30th, 30th hearing would not be held on the injunction because the agreement was that once the psychological evaluations were provided, then the injunction would be dismissed and the family law case would be dismissed. Okay. So the 30th hearing was supposed to be the joint motion for release of psychological evaluations. Okay. And what day was Doug murdered? So that he was murdered on Sunday, September 27th. 2020. Three, three days before this hearing was scheduled. Three days after the mediation, three days before the court date. And who was the judge scheduled to be at this hearing on the 30th? Chief Judge Diana Moreland. So the same judge that had heard the rest? Same judge. So the prosecution making a point that the same judge who denied her sole custody said her allegations were unfounded was about to hear a, another hearing and she had granted joint custody of the child uh, was about to um, hold another hearing on the matter just three days before Doug's death. So that was a, another point going to prosecution's motive. Vinny here that she had exhausted Ashley all of her options. She had made all these complaints, all these allegations. She had complained not only for herself as being abused, but her daughter as well. And all she had left to do was to just get rid of Doug altogether. Yeah, the timeline works in the prosecution's favor in all of this. She's, she's not winning in court. She's found to be not credible by the judge, and the same judge is going to be making another big ruling in another big hearing, and just beforehand, that's when she shoots and kills Doug Benefield, so that hearing is no longer, it's moot. It, it, it doesn't have to happen. All right, uh, what about Ashley's mental evaluation? Where, you know, wh how is all that playing into this? Well, the day culminated, which is likely the final witness for prosecutors here, with the clinical psychologist who was tasked, appointed to this family law case with Doug and Ashley to observe their relationship with their joint daughter and, again, to help provide who should have custody, who should be the one um, in charge of making those medical decisions. And he was able to testify limitedly to what Ashley had said to him and his observations. Let's take a listen to why that was important. She made it very clear on more than one occasion that she had no uh, intention of reconciling with Doug and that she had every intention of relocating to Maryland uh, with her mother in Emerson, particularly because her grandmother had passed away and her mother had inherited that home so she could return to her native home state of, uh, of Maryland. And did she indicate to you that she was going to go without Doug, go to Maryland without Doug? Uh, again, in several different occasions, she had indicated that was her intention. She did not want him uh, to come along with her. There was uh, some email exchanges indicating that she was trying to 
make that happen. Uh, he made it clear that he was going to be going there and thought that he'd be moving in with them, which she clearly made clear to me that that was not going to happen. Okay. So she made clear to you that he is not moving in. We are not getting back together. Yeah, absolutely. Did she say those things and act that way during the joint session with, with Doug? No. Okay. How was it different? It was different in that her um, presentation of herself was more deferential to Doug um, because her, her goal, as she had shared with me, was to, in essence, kind of appease him, go along with him, you know, because she was concerned he might uh, get angry and, and blow up. So she wanted to just kind of go, go with the flow, as the expression is, and therefore she was willing to go out to lunch or go to a movie or hang out with uh, him and Emerson. So she was not going to present that ultimate goal, certainly not with me. In those sessions, it didn't come up. So ultimately, the prosecution using his testimony to show that Ashley was saying one thing behind Doug's back, that she didn't want to be with him, she was done with the relationship, but presenting to Doug a completely different person. They even put through a detective the text messages in the week leading up to Doug's death and how, according to the state, she was you know, leading him on, encouraging him in a positive way when really she had nefarious reasons in which to do so. So uh, that would pick, picture inside the courtroom was very clear. However, you did hear him say that the defense will likely argue, Vinny, that she was just scared of him and didn't want to tell him the truth. Right. But again, I think she's got to be the one to do that. She's got to get up on the stand and do that. Um, at the top of the segment here, we talked about Doug's daughter, Eva. Um, you spoke with her today did. She's such an impressive young woman, Vinny. As you know, she is here. She's inside the courtroom uh, observing all of this. And as I mentioned, she did have to leave in a moment. She said that was so shocking to see those graphic photos. That's not how she remembers her father and who he is. But as with any court case, there are things the camera does not pick up, the things that happen in the hallway. This is unique, Vinny, because Ashley Benefield has a couple of rows of friends and family supporters here for her as well as you know the other side with Doug Benefield even to the point that the judge has said please leave separately you know wait till one family leaves because you have this odd awkwardness in the hallway of the courthouse even Ashley herself is out on $100,000 bond Vinny with an ankle monitor she can come and go from this courthouse each day so that is also interesting to observe when she leaves well I noticed a moment today at lunch where Eva the daughter waited and she stood outside the door at a moment that she, it seemed to me, wanted Ashley to see her. And I talked to Eva about that moment. Let's watch. I really wanted her to notice me. I wanted her to look me in the eyes, but she never did. But, yeah, I just... How do you think that is? But I just want her to know I'm here. And I'm, you know, doing everything I can to get justice for my dad. And I want her to know that I'm not scared of her. And I want her to look me in the eyes and see... That, like she I'm a real human being with real feelings and she took away the one person she knew that I love the most so again you can just see the emotion what how, how difficult this is for both sides really the families to be in there and uh, she wishes and really all the family members from Doug's side that I've spoken to so far Vinny wish and believe this should have been a first degree murder charge against Ashley because they believe she planned this and set him up and lured him there to that home but they understand why the prosecution has a second degree charge. Yeah and it's such a different dynamic in a courtroom when the defendant is coming and going and is free to go yes. out on bond and you've got victims family everyone there mixed together um, it, it is quite different. Chanley Painter at the courthouse tonight tomorrow another big day we know for sure my guess is she has to take the stand to tell her story if she wants any chance, any chance yep. of convincing this judge that she was standing her ground that day. Thanks so much, Chanley.